in the run-up to Rio Plus 20, the elders have been engaged in an eight weeks of online conversation with some of tomorrow's leaders, and they are called the Youngers. Let's have a look. People in our society should feel they are empowered with equal access to energy, healthcare, and quality education. For me, sustainable development is much more than caring for the environment. It's also much more than making money for my natural resources for my economic growth. It's the intersection between the economics, the social, and the environment. I dedicate my life to, to help build in a world where everyone can be free to self-determine how they want to live their lives. I'm driven by the vision of a world where everybody's grand, 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 grandchildren can live in harmony with nature and with each other. I'm joining the Elders and Youngers initiative because I believe that intergenerational dialogue and leadership will be an important step in the right direction. So please join our discussion and dialogue with the elders right now and share your idea of sustainable development with young friends all around the world. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, you've noticed there are two more chairs here, and it's time to fill them. So please welcome two of the youngers. We have... We have been joined by Esther Agbarakwe of Nigeria and Marvin Nala from China. So just give them a really good applause again. Marvin, you are 22 years old and you're studying, majoring in diplomacy at the Renmin University of China and actually also currently holding two internships. <laughs> and I had to call him after midnight when I was going to call him in Beijing because he was so busy. <laughs> so, but Marvin, what is your goal in life? Oh, my goal? Um, my goal is to help to um, further develop the civil society at China to help to get our environment better. Mm. You also worked, uh, had an internship for Greenpeace in China. And, and how do you work to mobilize young people in China? Um, young youth in China, they, are, um, they have different thoughts and concerns. Um, the way in China we do maybe a bit different with what we see from other foreign countries. What we do is trying to use new ways to use social media to get them interested in some public issues and uh, get them together and discuss things in more, you know, um, more easy ways. Yeah. yeah. And Esther, 28 years old from the Niger Delta. You're actually now serving in Washington, D.C. as an uh, Atlas Advocacy Fellow, serving at Population Action International, but you come from the Niger Delta, which is a huge wetland, known as the richest wetland in the world. It's also where Nigeria gets most of its oil and gas. And three years ago, you founded the biggest climate coalition for young people in Nigeria. Why did you do, do that? really involved in issues of environmental governance. They were not aware and the government did not think about them as moral stakeholders. So we, well, we saw what our peers were doing around the world, like in the US, in, in our country like Australia. We wanted to also make sure that our voices are heard. So um, we came together and, 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 and had a forum called Dialogue with the Elders um, to, to, yes, to, to ask them to please listen to us so that we can also be engaged in, in, in the negotiation and in the discourse about climate change. Because we believe that when young people know the urgency of the climate action that they will act, uh, and then we have been doing that in a very most traditional way of using social media and also talking to young persons in, in schools, in their houses, even in their farmlands, using whatever we have to make sure that they know about climate change issues. Because whatever way the government lives the environment, we will have to inherit it. Mm. 
and you, as Mary said, you are seeing the climate changes happening before your eyes. Absolutely. I was born in a, in a very lovely place um, called Spring Road. It was, um, we had the spring in our backyard. And this spring was what was providing water for the government because it was spring. And then this is where I went to fetch water for domestic users. This is where I went to, to learn how to swim. You know, but now those, the swim is gone because there was no protection and conservation of that particular resource, and we, we lost it. So whenever I walk in the street, I, I see something like Spring Road in, in, in America. I feel so connected because that was where I learned how to be very close to nature, but that we don't have that anymore. And some few kilometers away with the historical oil pollution in the Niger Delta that has you know, degraded the, the, the ecosystem in that area. And there's not so much that's done. And, and so we use the youth voice to, to ask the government to please consider our future and see what they can do to stop the oil pollution. I was reading your blog, Esther, and you say that we have the passion, but we need something more. Well, yes. What is it you need? From you, you can get it from these elders. Absolutely. I mean, the story of the elders has been amazing. All of them have been doing great work that has inspired all of us, and we're actually very grateful for this opportunity to be here. We, we, we have the passion and we have the, the knowledge, but sometimes we need the intergenerational uh, support um, that, uh, that, that, so that we can look up to you to, to move forward, because we ask our ourselves three basic questions is how do we help the elders to solve the problem? How do we not make this kind of mistake in the future by looking up to them, you know? And then how do we hold our government accountable for what they have done? And so, so we need that skills and that opportunity to act, to get inspired and then to get involved as well. And now Marvin and Esther, you have the opportunity to ask the elders face to face. And I know you have been working on these questions. So the floor is yours, it's up to you. Marvin, would you like to start? Oh, yes, I will start. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, as Bishop, I have seen you work so passionately about, <laughs> about <laughs> what you believed in. So my question is, um, what role do compassion have to play in making us move towards a more sustainable world? I, I said, actually, uh, as I right at the beginning, that uh, we were hoping that we can develop a, a world that is more compassionate. At the moment, most of what we, we be, we're behaving as if we're living in a jungle. Mm. And we say uh, the weakest to the wall, survival of the fittest. And I think uh, almost everywhere in the world, people are realizing that this is suicidal uh, because we are going to end up uh, <laughs> eating ourselves up. Uh, and whereas previously people used, you, there was a prime minister who used to speak about uh, the, the, the feeble uh, people who were wet, mm -hmm. she called them. They, they were wet because they, she said they didn't have backbone. What she meant was that they should be uh, aggressive and, and macho. Uh, and yet, actually, I mean, you ask yourself, why is it that the people we admire, even revere, aren't? Well, there are many things you could say about Mother Teresa, but macho wouldn't be one of them. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, and, and you say, no, what is true about them is that they were, they were good, they were people who, who cared, they were people who had a gentleness, mm -hmm. and our world needs this, and this is why I'm, I'm saying we probably need women, because women have it in their DNA, to, to, you know, they, they bring to birth, and then, and then they nurture, and they nurture gently, and, and, and caringly, and, and we, need, we need this. And, and, and if you think it is weak, you have to go to Liberia and, and think that this country was being destroyed by men, and it was the women without guns, who ended the war. 
Thanks, Your Grace. Are you happy, Esther? Absolutely. And now, now, just for the continuation, I would just urge everybody to, to make short answers because we have so many questions <laughs> coming. <laughs> I'm so, no offense. <laughs> I'm sorry. You scolded me. <laughs> no, you're quite right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Marvin. Um, uh, I, I have a question for um, Mrs. Gu Brunson. I know you are you have like uh, lead the report, uh, very famous Brunson report. Also, you are the special envoy. Envoy of uh, climate change. Um, so my question is more related to equity. Um, you know, for last year, the Durban climate negotiation, uh, we even cannot find the word CBDR in the final text. How do you define the common but differentiated responsibilities and the respective capacity? And what does it mean in our world where emerging economies have um, more and more influence to both the economy and the uh, environment issues? into that, the puzzle of agreeing globally about the interpretation of that notion. This notion, common but differentiated responsibilities, is still alive, you know, across the developing world. And as they gather in Rio, they will all have that in their minds, that yes, most of the problems have been created by the rich world. And so the rich world has to find ways also, you know, with regard to accountability and implementation of the kinds of um, promises or pledges that were made from 92 onwards about helping overcome the differences, improving equity and making it possible to move towards sustainable development. But I also said in the beginning here, or earlier, that the balance of these uh, responsibilities have changed. So your country, China, and I, your leadership has also understood, I think, that they have to start cracking doing changes in their own society because environmental problems are hitting Chinese. Yeah. It, it's not as if it's hitting Norwegians or Americans. Yeah. Sitting the so they are moving for their own benefit. Yeah. And, and now, why can't the world then, as people or leaders also, gradually see we have to do something at home? Mm -hmm. And we have to have health systems for the poor people in China. Yeah. And that is going to be delivered by the Chinese society. So it's an illustration, I think, of we have to be helpful and giving more finance resources to help people out of poverty and to make uh, this in every country helping. But the major powers and big parts of the world have to do important changes in their own societies too. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there will never be equity. Would you like to respond, Marvin? <laughs> I think it's a very good uh, response to my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Esther, let's... You're smart, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Esther. I do, yeah, I do believe that charity begins at home. It's something I personally believe in. I think that uh, we also need to look inwards to find solutions to our problem. And, and that, that means that we can actually transit for, to a more bet, better world if we sometime look inwards for the solutions that we are facing, especially in Africa. Um, I do have a may, question. May I, may I have to follow yeah. up? My sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I feel, because like, I feel that uh, I'm quite proud of um, what China is doing. They have like, put huge investment in the green technology and green yes. industry. Mm -hmm. They're like, doing a lot to help the uh, health system and uh, other social welfare needs get better. I think like, the big change is um, in the right direction, and China is very pre um, proactively take their responsibilities, not only for the domestic, but also you know um, China's performance in South-South cooperation and other fields. Mm -hmm. I think China, is the, uh, especially the top leaders, are quite aware of their responsibilities and, and the expectations from the international community. So yeah, I think things um, are getting in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I'm very pleased that uh, um, I heard the right understandings from um, the, uh, like you, 
guys, you're very um, smart and world leaders, which you can yeah. put your opinions to the other current yes, yes. leaders. Right? I have a question for Mary Robinson. Um, two days ago, uh, we know last week that at the United Nations um, co um, Commission on Population and Development, there was a landmark resolution about the reproductive health and rights of young people. So, um, Mrs. Mary Robinson, how do you explain to people why sexual reproductive health and right um, it's in the context of sustainable development is very important, especially at Rio Plus 20? It certainly is very important, Esther, and I know that you're aware of this because we've had previous conversations over the last few years. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And I find that in conferences now discussing sustainable development, discussing issues of climate, that somebody in the audience says, what about population control? Mm. Mm. And that's the wrong approach. Absolutely. Absolutely wrong approach, because we actually know what works. Yeah. It's educating girls and women, mm -hmm. including in reproductive health, and having a health system which will bring down maternal and child um, mortality. And we should be investing much more in that, which of course is also fulfilling the MDGs. Yes. And so we need to connect uh, the two, because I see, you know, in particularly in African countries, uh, growing populations that the governments would wish um, that the people had more opportunity to space and space their children, but they have what we call unmet needs for contraceptives. There are about 200 million or more people, mainly women of course, who would wish to have access to means of family planning. And it would be better for their countries, it would be better. And so this is a big issue that we have to get across. And I'm, I'm afraid it's an issue that globally is not going forward the way it should. So I hope that your generation will keep asking the right questions about it and bring it forward. Yeah, I think we're very, very concerned because right now and we have the highest number of young persons in human history and we're very concerned about what is happening. And we want to have the right to make our reproductive decision by ourselves as a fundamental human right. And we hope that the leaders here, for your work in human right, that you will help to take this um, request from most of the young people that our rights are very important to us and we, we want that to be supported and um, give us the power to make those decisions uh, by ourselves. I promise. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are soon to have some questions from the audience, but first, Marvin, do you have another one? Yeah, thanks. Right now, I have a question for Abhishek Tutu. <laughs> Again. <laughs> yes, um, my question is that uh, um, the world people admire you because of your lasting and persistent uh, um, efforts to, um, uh, for the uh, freedom at uh, South Africa, right? But it seems impossible 70, 60 years ago. What does support you and, uh, uh, in your whole life to support you continue your journey and keep fighting, just keep fighting? What's the, your magical power <laughs> under that? And can you maybe um, share with the young people of this generation I tried to say right at the beginning that one of the most incredible uh, sources of uh, energy for me is when I am with young people. Because, y sorry oldies, <laughs> <laughs> but all, almost all of the young people I have met are incredible incredibly, incredibly idealistic. It's when they are infected by our cynicisms later that they begin to be like us. But I mean, speak, ask any child and you will find, I mean, how did we get our freedom in South Africa? It was largely because we were supported in the anti-apartheid movement. And yes, it was not just young people, but it was largely young people who said, this is, a, this is ghastly, it's unacceptable. It's young people even today who say, let's make poverty history. It's young people who are saying, it is. I mean, we were in, in, in Copenhagen with Mary, and, and the young, it was bitterly cold, but young people would go out in demonstrations saying, we've got to do something about climate change. And 
it's over to you. Uh, I mean, they, they, or you, I should say, you and, and, your, and your comrades are, are what gives me hope. It is, it is, it is what lifts me. And, and, and I have no doubt at all that you are going to succeed where we failed. former Prime Minister Glo. Glo, I, I wanted to ask you in your time, that was like 20 years ago, was it very hard to define sustainable development? Was it very hard for you and your team to define sustainable development? What, 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 what inspired you to have that conclusion about sustainable development? You know, it, it, it was really the, the 22 people from different parts of the world analyzing from area to area and coming to the conclusion that all of these things are linked together, the ones that we were addressing, from energy to uh, industry uh, to population, I mean, to family planning, the rights of women, all of these issues that we discussed, we saw that they were all linked. And we said, everything is linked to everything else. So the concept about what is then as we have to deal with these interlinkages, and the, then the basic assumption here is that we, unless we, and we didn't have time to wait for generations to have that happen, the intergenerational aspect of the concept came to all of us. And we knew it is because of young people and because of coming generations that all of this has to happen. And we are all responsible. It came to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have questions coming in from the audience. And, and I'd just like to mention one straight away, because there is one person here who has asked, how can we build enthusiasm and excitement around Rio plus 20? <laughs> enthusiasm and excitement. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I think myself that the intergenerational does create excitement it does. because you're interested to know, you know, the, our experience and we love your enthusiasm and your idealism and also your perspective. You have a perspective into the future, which the world needs to think about and doesn't think about enough. Politicians think three years, five years next week. And we need to say, no, we need to think intergenerationally for the very reasons that Guru has been emphasizing. And uh, I think that we do need that enthusiasm and it has to become a real movement leading up to Rio because we need to put more pressure on those who have a responsibility to be actually the delegates taking decisions. And, um, and um, I think um, um, a kind of excitement of a positive energy is much better than saying, oh, Rio is going to fail. Mm -hmm. I think we need to really be looking forward and have the ideas, as I know you have, of what you want to see coming out of Rio. <laughs> we, we've had one question on Twitter as well, and uh, that question is, I think perhaps you should answer it as a lawyer, is, is an international crime of ecocide the answer to sustainability? Well, you know, I don't know, we haven't recognized that international crime, but we should think in terms of being in a crisis about where we're going. Um, the world is in much more of a crisis than we realize in using up um, the fragile ecosystems of our world. And uh, at a time when we have the fastest growing population ever, and uh, all of these things we have to address. Um, when the Brundtland Report came out with this wonderful concept of sustainable development, it had three pillars which grew knows so well. Economic sustainability social sustainability and environmental sustainability. And somehow we didn't bring out enough the social and the envi <laughs> environmental. And now we're faced with even more the intergenerational. And I think we will see, we're seeing cases now. There's a case in the United States courts that young people have brought about the atmosphere. I've only just actually got a, a, an email about it today, so I haven't followed it fully. But it's actually challenging that um, the atmosphere is being destroyed by fossil fuel um, emissions and that young people know in their lifetimes it's going to have very serious implications and they're litigating it. So litigation can help to address the urgency. Taking in one more question now, I'd like, I'd like you all to answer, all the elders to answer, just in one sentence, 
And this is going to be a hard one. <laughs> this is going to be a hard one. Someone in the audience asks you, what advice can you give to a young leader? The best advice you can give to a young leader in one sentence. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one sentence. <laughs> Be yourself and think long term. No. No. Care. Be yourself, think long term, care, and involve others. <laughs> <laughs> I also have one question, because I know you have, you, you're concerned, Mary, that people can learn from your mistakes. Mm. You've, you've done a lot of great things, yeah. but you probably have also made, made mistakes. Is, is there one mistake you've made that they, the youngers and, and we can learn from? Yeah. One I mistake. I think um, one of the mistakes that we have made is not to be more people-centered. Uh, the whole debate on climate change has been about the science and the environment and melting glaciers and even nice cuddly polar bears on ice floes. Mm -hmm. Not people yeah. suffering in getting food to the table, having to go much further for the firewood. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's been a big mistake and I think we really have to address that, address that mistake. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? You know, I, absolutely, but I think the, re the you know, when you look at why has this happened, it is because if you try to prove that the reason that people are suffering and are seeing what uh, you, Esther, have been describing about the changes in your own area, uh, which are related to climate change, that's even worse if the world is not ready to agree on the science. Yep. So, you know, it's like biting yourself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the tail. Mm -hmm. but. Everything has, everything is related, the relationship between people and people's needs and the planet that we all need to protect to survive. Mm. That's what it amounts to. Yeah. So it is people at the center, mm. but dependent on nature and, and each other. Mm -hmm. Now, would you like to share a mistake, Your Grace? Yes. Is there? No. I mean, mine is uh, a kind of universal mistake, and it is to demonize your opponent. Mm. Uh, we did that, uh, I think, when we were struggling against apartheid. And, 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 and I think, I mean, if we, were, if we had been a great deal more uh, accommodating, uh, we might have won over many more white people. You know, it, as, as they say, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know the youngest have mobilized their networks in China and in Nigeria, and I'll leave it to you to ask Two final questions from yeah. your networks. Yes, I have one. One of my friends in Nigeria, his name is um, Kenneth, said, what will, what will a cleaner tomorrow look like? That's another question. What will a cleaner tomorrow look like? And, and, and another one asks that, how do you empower young people like me to be able to be bold enough to, to do what we are doing? Think about the cleaner tomorrow. Um, it means that in every home there would be electricity. 1.4 yeah. billion people don't have electricity today. Absolutely. It would mean that women wouldn't be inhaling smoke from cooking on coal and dung and, and, and firewood. And there are 2.7 billion out of 7 billion who do that now in our world today. If you have clean, a clean world, you have a world where you have health and education. Children have light to study. Uh, it's a world to me where a lot of human rights, rights to food, safe water, health, education, will be delivered, and it is a possible world, and that's why it's doable. Yeah, okay. We have to have a clean world. It's doable. And yes. how, how do you empower the young people to be bold enough to, to do no, this? The young people have to empower themselves. Hmm. Yeah, first. It is, I mean, it, you know, you know as, that's why I said be yourself, you know? Hmm. If you observe something, if you analyze what's around you, you see what's right and wrong, you move on it. 
You don't wait for everyone else around you to tell you what to do. Absolutely. Great. Marvin, Absolutely. do you have a question? Yeah, we, I have a question. Um, my friends on actually the Chinese Facebook and Chinese Twitter give us lots of questions. Here is one excellent one. Um, uh, we know that's like uh, countries that have different background, they have different um, ideology, different culture, different traditions. But like uh, in the environment constra constraints, that how can the countries reach a consensus in an effective but also efficient way? How can we just get uh, an, an agreement on how to deal with our environment and development mm -hmm. in a quick manner? Mm -hmm. I, I would keep trying to say to people, we have one world. Yes. Mm -hmm. And whether it is a poor per, uh, country or a rich country which has emissions and we destroy this one earth, our earth home, we are all done for. We, we will all be dead, rich and poor, tall and short, fat and not so fat. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Marvin, if I may, um, that is exactly what happened in Durban in the enhanced platform now. Mm -hmm. All the country said, mm -hmm. we, will we will work towards an agreement by 2015. Mm -hmm. We cannot get that agreement without answering your earlier questions. Yeah. Equity, mm -hmm. uh, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective ca uh, capacities, um, right to development. Absolutely. And it's going to be a real engagement if we have an agreement by 2015. Mm -hmm. And it has to be young people mm -hmm. who insist that we get the agreement mm -hmm. because it's so much your future. Yeah. We absolutely need an agreement because otherwise countries won't fulfill their commitment to reduce the emissions. And we're not going safe towards a safe world at the moment. We're going way above it, more yeah. like four degrees Celsius yes. and worse than that. I, so like, I like to say that really, young people are very, very inspired to do, if, if you saw what happened in Durban, mm -hmm. we were sitting right there in the yeah. negotiation hall without living, protesting mm. that the government must come up with something mm. good. And around the world, look at the Occupy movement, they're really, really holding government accountable. And this is quite inspiring because we're very concerned about the future and we really, really want them to do something about it. And we also have solutions to this problem mm. as well. I don't think we should, you should forget that. Mm. Now we are watching them and we also have solutions and we're ready to work with the government to provide solutions for this problem that we have. Mm. I, I think we shall leave Esther to have that last word because the elders are very busy and they're off to uh, next task. <laughs> so I would please ask you to remain seated as the elders leave the stage, but give them a really, really warm applause. Thank you.